On Sunday, we looked at Jesus descending from Bethphage. On Sunday, in a traditional Pesach experience in Israel 2,000 years ago, was the day of the choosing of the lambs. So your lambs were paraded before you one by one for you to choose the one that was going to be a part of a sacrifice, or if you will, a Pesach. And on that day, Jesus is descending in his own entourage, if you will, weeping over the inevitable refusal of those people. And yet the ironic thing of the whole thing is that the possession of the people are actually looking completely opposite of that. They're throwing down fruitless leaves and throwing down empty words. But it's late. Jesus had an appointment and been there since Daniel to the day for him to show up on that day and be presented. So we expected it. But Daniel didn't tell us what was going to happen that night. And Jesus, it was late in the evening. So if you will, Jesus goes back to Bethany to, I would like to think, to return the donkey. And that takes us to Monday. Monday is Chemetz. Chemetz is leaven. It's the day when you make sure that your house is completely clean of leaven so that you can celebrate the Passover in your house. Well, Jesus has his own sort of housekeeping, if you will, his house cleaning. And he does the same thing. He drives out the consumerism that is there. As the court of the Gentiles had become a farmer's market. And he flips over the tables of the money changers and those who sold doves, the seats, as if you will, turning right side up the whole idea of who serves whom for whose benefit. Then Matthew tells us that the blind and the lame come forth to be healed by Jesus. If you're the kind that's always sort of envisioned the idea, and I think we've had a lot of help from Hollywood, that Jesus kind of just got overtaken, turned into sort of a God version of the Hulk, just started making a whip of three chords and just started overtaking by violent anger, just started chasing people out, because he certainly does. People, by the way, three times five times, three by five times the length of a football pitch. If Jesus really had that kind of emotional meltdown, would the lame and the blind actually come to him afterwards to be healed? Wouldn't you think maybe we should wait a little bit for him to calm down? <laughs> but as Sunday was the day of the picking of the lamb, and on Sunday was the day that our lamb was picked, on Monday was the day that you drive out the leaven, Jesus was driving the leaven out of his house. But it was specific. We could have just read that God had, that after Jesus had driven out the temple, that people in need of healing came forth and were healed. So not distracting his own. <laughs> but God made really specific mention that it was two groups of people, those that had lost vision and those that had a weak walk. That's a really important point. And, and I, in my own time, as I read that, there's a part of my heart that says, have I made a marketplace of the place you intended prayer to be? Is my vision impaired now? Is my walk weak? Because he's like, it's reparable, it's changeable. But for that to happen, I'm going to need to clean this thing up and set things right side up. And that was yesterday. But what's interesting is, is that of all those that were blind that came to be healed, well, it wasn't everybody that was blind, just the people who knew the need. It's Tuesday now, just like this, and on Tuesday is the day of Tamim. Tamim is the day, Tamim means perfection, if you will. And it is the day where you are calling out to look. to discover if there be any imperfections in your um, in your lamb that's going to be sacrificed. It's not the 12th of Nisan. 
Now in Exodus chapter 12, when God introduces the idea, he tells us initially, your lamb has to be without blemish, a male in the first year. It's not an acceptable sacrifice unless it's blemishless, if you will. It's not a sacrifice unless it's to me. So they go through this period of inspection. And really, according to Leviticus 22, there's four basic areas for which you are to observe to see whether or not this sacrifice is acceptable. And you know what's interesting? The first two are, it cannot be blind and it cannot be lame. Also, it cannot be scarred with a skin disease. You know, one sort of an oozing, gross, nasty thing. And you're like, well, you take it. I don't want, to, you don't want to pet this thing. And I find it interesting. The reason I'm sort of kind of being methodical about this is that your lamb is being scrutinized really on sort of four categories to make sure that this lamb is an acceptable sacrifice for the Passover, for the Passover. Why is that important? Because in our text on this day, the 12th of Nisan, a Tuesday before Jesus is to be crucified, he is confronted four times by people who are trying to find a defect in him. And it's perfectly fitting how everybody's doing that to their lambs anyways. So it shouldn't surprise us that that's what's happening in Jesus as well. Now, for the sake of time, we could go into the length of it. And I do want to humbly ask, like always, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible have the final say. Don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. And I suggest you read the entirety of the text. But for our sake of time and for clarity on this tonight, my intent is to go over the questions that are asked, the scrutinies that they are using to try to find fault in Jesus. Interesting, after this text, for what it's worth, these questions, by the way, in the midst of it, Jesus will actually toss out three Parables, that'll be for another night, for another thing. But after that, Jesus will then teach his longest, his harshest sermon, and his heaviest revelation he will actually ever teach in all of the time that we have on this, in the Gospels. His last sermon, and he goes out with a bang. It will be the woes, if you remember. And he'll, you know, he will say on, on, eight, on nine occasions, woe, on eight occasions, woe, 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 woe. And then he'll say about the end of the world, so that's sort of whoa, whoa. And then he'll tell us that we should watch. So it's like, whoa, 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 watch. That's sort of the whole summary of that whole thing. Interestingly enough, in the woes that Jesus gives us, where he actually says, how will you escape hell, the condemnation of hell? Think that through. Jesus is openly declaring these people to be condemned in their heart at a moment like this five times in his text, in his woe sermon, he calls them blind. I don't find that to be circumstantial or you know, coincidental. He'll call them blind guides, fools and blind, he'll call them twice. So there's a lot to learn from these four confrontations. And, and again, I'm going to pull a part of it, and I'm not trying to pick and choose. I challenge you again to make sure you read the rest. But I'm doing it from the perspective of if these people are living a life that's condemnable to Christ, don't let me, don't let an echo of this be found in my soul. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. It's Tuesday now. And we read... Now, when he had come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him. I'm sorry, there's a turn on accessibility. Is that important? The chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him, as the term we see here. It means to accost. As he was teaching. And they said, by what authority are you doing these things? 
Who gave you this authority? Our first group of people that are confronting Jesus are the chief priests and the elders of the people. Who are they? They are your MPs. They are, first of all, the people that represent your precincts, your borough. They're the representatives of a, of a larger group of people sent then to, in essence, plead the case for their area. Only in their case, it was tribal ours is more, of course, locational. And what they have in common is that they were granted exousia. Exousia is the Greek word for authority. It's different than words like dunamis, where we speak of power to overcome resistance, which can be innate or something that is sort of, you know, that's something you have within you. Exousia is something granted to you. If you will, it's sort of license or, you know, whether that be through a vote or whether it be granted through some form of jurisdictional way, one way or another, you're given that authority. And it is important to recognize that's their question. And so they're asking, well, who gave you yours? They knew who theirs came from. Oddly enough, it wasn't God. They're asking God, who gave God the authority to be able to say the things he's saying? And I just find that, first of all, a little bit frightening, don't you? And in, in each of these, I have a question to ask myself, and I pray you would ask the same uh, for yourself. Because Jesus will end the gospel of Matthew by sending us out to go into all the world and make disciples of people, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he says a statement right before that, and he says, all authority has been given to me. And the word authority is this word right here. Imagine Jesus, and did you notice, by the way, Jesus actually won't defend himself on this. He'll actually return. He will return with a question in regards to authority of someone else, John the Baptist. But here's the beginning of this. Now, Mark will say that scribes were part of this group. Luke will add to this fact that he is, whilst he is preaching the gospel, they're doing this. And unique, by the way, to our first confrontation is that they actually interrupt Jesus in the middle of what he's doing. Don't miss that. The people that have a problem with authority have no interest in listening because they have their own agenda and they're going to jump right into the situation. Jesus is teaching. He's preaching the gospel. And in the middle of walking and teaching and preaching the gospel, they shut him down to ask this question. Kind of like a policeman that sort of says, excuse me, hey, Bob, what are you doing? How are you doing? You know, and it's like, who gave you this? Let me see your license is sort of the idea. Are you really a busker? Where's your busker's license? That kind of thing. And I start to ask this, and here's our first thing on it. And again, I, there's so much to develop, but I just want to keep it simple enough for application. The first conclusion I ask myself is, who's the boss? Because that's what the exousia is, is a granted bossdom, if you will. And I ask my own question of that, who's really the boss? When I talk to people about God out there, and I've had the privilege of doing that in a lot of cases here, even this week, and they talk about their made up idea of version of God, and I ask, well, who's the boss? Who really is making, for your life, who really is the boss? And if they're gonna be honest, the real, price, the real answer is they are. They're, they, they don't really, don't, they don't mind having a God that can serve them. They don't mind having a God that can heal them or grant them heaven and not hell or whatever the case, but they do have a problem with somebody telling them that they can't be the boss of their own life anymore. Now, I want to say this to sort of pepper this information for a moment. And it's, I had an experience today. It's been quite an eventful week already. Person pulled from the train. We were sort of involved in that. That was on our way here, by the way. Then we had a stabbing right in front of the station the next day at Camden Down Station. I was turning the corner right when that was happening. It's been fun. And I thought, well, how, what could possibly top that? I got hit in the face today. Didn't expect to see that one coming. And by the way, right around the corner. I, had, I was on my way home from the morning, my morning meetings. And there was a guy and he appeared to be like he appeared to have stumbled. He appeared to have sort of hurt himself. So I, I sort of leaned towards the guy to just say, and I, I'm asking, do you need any help? Do you need help up? 
I'm just trying to be a cool bloke over this situation. And, and I'm sort of like, you know, hey, mate, do you, do you need a hand up? And the guy turns around and just open hand right up my face. And I, and, and I can see from his face, his face has been, it's been adjusted. It's been adjusted a few times. Uh, and, you know, you can kind of get the idea sometimes when someone's had their face adjusted and they really didn't volunteer for that. This, this, and, and he looks at me and he's quite angry. And he says, look at my face again. Now, understand, his face was away from mine when I started this whole thing. But you could clear, you know, so you could tell he was he was bothered. He flipped around at me, does this, and I look at him and he's like, look at my face again. And I'm like, I'm here to help. And, and he goes to try to take another swing and I'm like, I, I start to walk away and he starts to come after me. And so then I just turn around and I'm like, we're done here. You're clear on that, right? We're done here. And that was enough. And of course, in between that time, I'm going in the name of Jesus, Satan, get out of this. And so, and at that point, he just goes to bothering somebody else. And now I have to deal with, okay, I'm going to go into the house. Do I tell my wife that around the corner, I just got hit in the face. The, the, the reason I'm telling you that is, is that the whole purpose for me in interfacing with the individual is I was wanting to help. I was wanting to help this guy up. And all he could think about was sparring with the very person who was trying to help him. In our text, in all four of these cases, these are jabs thrown at the Savior. This is sparring with the Savior, fighting with the Father, who is seeking to pull them up out of their own blindness, pull them out of their own lameness, and they're fighting the God who wants to save them with these questions. Have you ever shared Jesus with someone and they throw one of those jabs at you? I call them Christian pepper spray. You know, well, you're like, you're starting to share. They're like, oh, yeah, what about the Inquisition? Or what about the Pope? Or what about, you know, it is if somehow I'm going to be like, oh, no, never mind. You're right. You stay evil. I just, I just. And it amazes me. And so I just love to have fun with it. Who is Cain's wife? And I'm just like, Mishlugana. And I just make up something. And that's like, no, you, now you, there goes that pepper spray. Or what about the Pope? I'm like, I don't know. He's never invited me over to dinner. Has he invited you over to dinner? Do you know the Pope? Or what about the Inquisitions? How old do I look? <laughs> And the point of it is, it's amazing how, if we we're really doing it in the right heart, we're saying, I I'm trying to help here. You don't understand. My intent in all of this is to want to see you come to the God that has saved me, that has trans transformed me, that has revolutionized me. I was you. I know where you're at. I've been there. I don't want you there anymore. Do you not want you there anymore? Because you're fighting the hand that's really seeking to help. So imagine this is Jesus and they're coming out. Who's a Thor? Who do you think you are to tell me that? And I think in my own life, though, it's easy to look at other people that you know are making it up. And you know that they're doing it because they don't want a Lord in their life that's not them. Although they really don't even realize that they're, they're not even the Lord of their own life anyways. The enemy is running and ruling their life. Ephesians makes that really clear in Ephesians 2. They try to convince people of that. And, and, and I look at that and I just think, but what about me? Am I fighting God is who the real boss is in this in my own life? Because I've learned that my sin looks so much uglier on you or anyone else. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not so bad on me. But then I look at someone else with that sin. I'm like, oh, that's awful. That's horrible. So I think about it with me. So the first question we ask in all of these, and I pray you would ask these questions with me. The first is, well, who's really the boss in this situation? What authority, who granted me the authority to think I should have authority over my own life? Did I have a meeting or I passed the judgment and in, in passing the judgment, I decided I should be the boss of my life? Number two, Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, mind you, saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, Luke, by the way, adds this information. They watched him and sent spies. Hear this. They sent spies. You realize spies are in the Bible? 
They sent, they sent spies who pretended to be righteous. Spies pretending to be righteous. I love to remember that verse. That's verse 20, by the way, of Luke in the text. When gals, you know, we were talking, sharing Jesus, and they're like, well, I went to church one, and I dated this guy. And oh, was he awful. Call himself a Christian. Oh, you know, I don't know anything to do with Jesus. So I'm like, well, according to this, there were spies who pretended to be righteous right here to try to stop Jesus. You really think? Because I think that the devil could show up in some churches, and the church wouldn't even know it. And so, you know, the only reason I say that, and it'll tell us, by the way, that if Satan pretends to be an angel of light, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that those who serve him masquerade themselves as ministers of righteousness. You can do so much more damage by pretending to be someone else. That's not an encouragement, mind you. So they're trying to trap Jesus. We get that. They're spies who are trying to trap Jesus. They're pretending to be righteous, trying to trap Jesus. Now, the of the of the four of these altercations, the first one's unique because they cut Jesus off in the middle of what he's doing. But the next three, oh, they'll have this in common. They'll all call him teacher. No one's going to call him Lord, of course. But they all call him teacher. They'll be like, excuse me, teacher. But this one uniquely, they do a thing called captatio benevolentiae. Captatio benevolentiae is when you approach somebody in dignity, someone in nobility, someone that is sort of a dignitary, uh, and it's commonly used, and you'll see it in the book of Acts often, you sort of, in essence, sort of suck up to the person when you start. Oh, King Herod, or oh, King Felix, or oh, Festus, or we know that the kingdom has experienced such great peace with you, and oh, how we've benefited since you've been here. It's like blah, 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 blah. And by the way, and you know those people that are like, hey, I love you, Lois, you're such a nice person, and you're so sweet. And then you know the other hand's kind of winding up. It's like that that's the alcohol swab before you get the jab, right? <laughs> You know, they're like, oh, you're, you're such a nice person and you're so sweet, Rowan, and I love listening to you, but I only want to be friends, you know, and you're like, could you just started with that? You know, I wouldn't have had to buy you this coffee. <laughs> yeah. And the, the point of it is, is that they are, they are exclusively the ones who are pretending to be righteous. Me thinks that the group praises too much. You know, where they're like, they're really over-talking the situation. Oh, Jesus. Oh, wow, do we know this about you. First of all, we know that you teach the truth. We know that you're true, and you teach the way of God and truth, and you don't play favorites. Isn't that kind of basically what they're saying? Now, the, the idea of the, you don't care about anyone is not you don't care about anyone like we might think in the sense of you just think that you have no concern for anyone. The idea of it is, you don't play favorites. You don't have a care for a person, whether they're wealthy or they're not. They're basically all the same people, which, by the way, aren't you thankful that when people watch Jesus, that was the conclusion they came to? After all, that is God in the flesh. And I am sure thankful God doesn't play favorites, especially in our current culture. It's not like, oh, you're a boy. Well, you have favor. Oh, you're a, you're a girl or you're white or you're, you're black or you're rich or you're poor or you're educated or you're not. Or, oh, you're, a, you are, you're, you're more needy than that person. I, I tend to see that the people Jesus seems to spend the most time with are just the ones that need the most time. You know, it isn't like Jesus wouldn't go, Peter, wow, do I love spending time with you. If there's anyone Jesus had to sort of bail out of emotional jail more than once, it was Peter. I mean, who else did he say, get behind me, Satan, to? Let's just be honest. After he had just done one of the greatest things that Peter had will do until the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and that's identify Jesus as the Messiah. And he's like, yeah, Peter, you're spiritual. You have spiritual Wi-Fi on. And then he's like, but don't go to the cross, Jesus. And he's like, oh, my goodness, good catch, bad throw. And I'm just saying that because they're trying to trap him, but they really look, if, if anyone other than Jesus, we would go, look at these guys. I would be intimidated by them. Have you ever seen something like, oh, man, their walk with Christ. I'll never be that. And what if it's this person? And they're super playing it out. It's, you know, there's like super follower when really all they are is a spy pretending to be righteous. Now, don't be, don't be paranoid. But what I say, but please be pure. Just don't be this. Because we can all pretend to be righteous. 
Or we could be Christ righteous. If you're not Christ righteous, you're self righteous, by the way, because everything else is about how you do it. And so the question is, what about this, this Caesar? And, and you get it, if we don't play favorites, how far do you go with those not playing favorites? Much of the Jewish nation hates the Romans because they're browbeating them, they're abusing them, they, they're, they're helpless behind them. And it's natural to hate a, piece, a person that you're convinced is your oppressor. And in their case, they've done enough to justify that. In, in, in all of that, then they're like, so if you don't play favorites, well, what about them? Are, are they, are you okay with them too? I mean, look at how nasty, how horrible, how wicked, how evil those people, and they're Gentiles. Of course, they're going to be that way. And Jesus, like always, you just can't play a game of chess with God and think you're going to win it, or, or you're really the delusional one. So Jesus, give me a denarius, which, by the way, is an interesting thing because he's in the temple and you're not supposed to have any foreign coins in there. Remember that whole money changers thing? So the question someone might ask, well, did they set up the next day? Would you set up the next day if Jesus flipped your tables over? Maybe, maybe not. And my answer to that is, well, Jesus asked for a denarius and they gave him one and they should not have those in the temple. So just maybe the money changer tables weren't there anymore. And as a result of that, they just brought their own money in and they were stuck with it. But he asked for, he asked for a denarius. That's a Gentile coin. That is a coin. It's a day's wage. And it is, of course, a Roman coin. Now, I actually used to have a Roman denarius and I used to use it of Tiberius, and I would use that coin often until I shared this message, well, not this message, but I shared a bit of this information at some particular rehab house. And uh, ultimately, when I went home that day, the coin was gone. I'm not bitter. And then they, whoever, whoever took it, they're not going to be able to do anything with that. They're like, eh. All of that said. So Jesus goes and he goes, well, whose image is on this? And they're like, Caesar. And he goes, well, if it, if it bears his image, it belongs to him, don't you think? But I love how he doesn't end with that. That actually shut down the argument, didn't it? That was enough. This is, and, and, and he couldn't have done this yesterday because they wouldn't have had a denarius in the, in the temple. But now he's got one, so God's methodical. So give him the, give him the Caesar. What, if it bears his image, it belongs to him. Give him what it belongs to him. But then give unto God what belongs to God. And that's a simple math. This has his image. It belongs to Caesar. If it's a Caesar's image, it belongs to Caesar. Give to Caesar what belongs to him. Well, then what has God's image? What was made in his image? We were. It's like, well, you were made in God's image. You bear the image of God. So you belong to God. So give to God what belongs to God. So the second question I have to ask in conclusion is, well, what do I owe him? The first one is, well, who is the boss? And the second is, well, what do I owe him? Because... When you talk to someone who is playing Manby Pamby Christianity, and they kind of play this kind of goofy game where it's sort of like, yeah, I'm really happy with Jesus, and I just love, I got the warm fuzzies, and I just, he's my bro, he's my homeboy. And I'm thinking, but do you have a sense at all that, he, that your life belongs to him? Because Paul would tell you, the Corinthians, you were bought the price, glorify God with that body, because you are the temple of the living God, and God bought that and I really do think it's one of the reasons why so much attention is trying, trying to, to try to present God not as creator. Because if God isn't your creator, then he's an intruder in your life. But if he created you, he owns you, and you belong to him. And I think there's something pro proudly privileged about that. But I also want, first of all, that also doesn't make, that puts dogs on a lower level, with all due respect, and cats and any other animal. Cool that they are, with all due respect, we have no record that they're going to heaven, but we do have a record that your life is in the balance and you better deal with that. And I'm just not trying to be mean. There's no Santa either. Be warm and filled. But <laughs> I do want to point out, though, that, that you were made in God's image because you are an intentional creation from the perfect masterpiece maker. And you are going to be accountable to that. But because God is, and think about this, because God is the creator, and the sustainer, for by him and for him all things were created, and by him all things consist. When God says something's bad and everyone else wants to take a vote because according to their feelings, they'd rather do that. And they're like, again, if God isn't creator, now he's intruding into my life telling me what I should like and what I shouldn't like. My doctor does that too, by the way. 
I love spicy food and the doctor says you shouldn't be eating that. And I'm like, well, who do you think you are, Mr. Healthier Than Thou? And the whole idea of it is, is that he's trying to look out for me and all of this, but I know that anytime I'm going to eat something like that, I'm going to pay for it. And if I'm just going to be candid, so is my wife. Okay. And, and the only reason I'm saying that is, is that God, because he's our creator, he's like, if you have this attraction or you are driven to this and you want to fulfill your appetite in this manner, God says, don't do that because the creator knows you better than you know you. And you'd be like, but I want to do it. God's like, that's not in question here. But what is in question is whether this is going to be good for you when I'm telling you it's not. And when I can look at that, I can have the audacity to tell somebody, you really shouldn't do this because God says otherwise. And they're like, so what's your opinion on this? And, and, and unless you're God, I love Billy Graham's answer when they asked about that, because when they asked him how he felt about homosexuality, how he felt about, and they listed like premarital sex and so forth. His answer, and I love this, he just, you know, and he kind of talked like this, right? he's like, well, it doesn't matter what I like, what I feel, what I think. What matters was what the Bible says. And then you just started quoting verses. Because in the end of it all, you're going to have to take it up with the author anyways. So my first two questions, and I'll pick this up for the sake of time. But the first two questions is, who's the boss? And what do I owe him? And my answer is, Jesus is the boss. And I want Matthew. Number three, Matthew 22, 23. The same day, of course, because this is Inspect the Lamb Day. And by the way, this really is a good tea. Just okay. The same day the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to and asked them, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise an offspring for his brother. And by the way, this is the, the right of a Leverite marriage, uh, and that is from Deuteronomy 25. And the idea of it is, and this, boy, if this were the case, I would have been much more involved in my brother's marriage <laughs> beforehand. Uh, with all due respect to who he's married, but it's sort of like you, then you're going to have to outlive me because if you die, I have to marry this girl. So you, anyways, you get it. And so the, and this is a classic, very liberal approach. It, and I want to warn you, you're going to experience this in the world around you if you haven't already. And the idea of it's quite simple that uh, can I create a scenario where your rule appears to be heartless? Can I create a scenario? Now, it doesn't have to be true. I just need to create a scenario where you're going to look dumb for thinking what you think. And whether that's, I don't, you shouldn't be out killing children, not only for your own sake, or not only for the baby's sake, I'm less concerned about that baby than I am for you, because you're going to have to bear that information before God and that choice you've made. Now, I'm not tired to talk about your past, but I'm here to challenge you for your future. And, and in that, I'm like, I care enough for you that I've been around enough people who've had that history and I know where that goes. And, it can be a very horrible and a very dangerous place. And I, you just, you get this idea where they're like, well, what about, what about this situation? And what about that situation? And I'm like, do you personally know any situation like that? Well, I've read it in an article that may have been a fiction uh, publication or an op-ed, and yet it's enough to create a scenario and that's all that matters. And that's what they're doing. And here's the situation. This woman was married to a guy and he died. And so the brother had to marry her. Problem was that there were seven brothers and they all kept dying. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was like number six, I think I'd fake my own death before I married the girl because this woman's got a terrible track record. I don't know what she's cooking or whatever it is, but I'd hide the bleach and I would get out. And it was all of that. And so like, oh, so she's married, they all die. So, and then finally, believe it or not, the woman dies. She ate her own meal. And, and in that now, there's these seven people she married on earth. Which one is she going to be married to in heaven? Ha ha! Created the story that shut you down, Jesus. Really, you're going to shut Jesus down, right? And I love that this is the one group of people he says, you are mistaken. And he says two things that I don't want you to miss. And this is Matthew 22, 29. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Traditionally, when you go to church and they're going to be one or the other, or sometimes both, you have the churches that are going to focus on the word of God and you're going to be informed. And then they're going to be those that will focus on the spirit of God. And I'm using the terms loosely where you're going to have a lot of experience. And usually when people talk about the Christianity, they will talk about it from the perspective of revelation or experience. 
And there will be those that will be like, oh, I had this warm fuzzy and I had the shakes and I had this and honey dripped from heaven and the feathers fell. And I don't want to argue with anyone's experience. The important thing is, have you surrendered to Christ and do you know the gospel? Have you surrendered to the Jesus of the Bible? That's the important thing. And there are places, praise God for places where you can have a lot of experience because you'd probably be bored to death here with us. Just want to say. And so praise God you can have that. But there are experiences and we know you can go to, and by the way, any good relationship should have some form of experiences in it. Um, but there are those you can have worship experience and you can have the whatever the case is. But there's that. Then on the other side, there are going to be those that we're going to, ah, you're going to be taught, you're going to be informed, we're going to be equipped and whatever the case is. What's interesting is the reason I bring that up is Jesus says, you guys don't have either. He's like, you don't know the, if you would have read your Bibles or you would have had an honest experience with God, you wouldn't be asking me this goofy question. So of all the questions people have tried to trap Jesus, I kind, this is my take on it. Jesus is, this is the one that makes him go, this is the dumbest question I've ever been asked. Because this is the most unscriptural question. This is, the, you have no experience in this area, but you, you, you like sat together and prognosticated in a creative writing class to come up with this. And he goes, in heaven, you don't get, you're not married in heaven to each other because you're like angels and the angels can't be married. Interesting, by the way, because part of the requirement for people to be married requires a physical union between a man and a woman. And that you're not to this day in ultra Orthodox communities, you're not considered married until the, until the two of you actually consummate the marriage physically. Maybe there are places where you do that at the wedding ceremony in a, in a, in a thing called a chupa, basically like a tent for us. That's the most appalling thing we could possibly imagine. We're, we're a little bit more what we're refined in a different way. But the, but the reason I say that is to Jesus to speak to these people, he's, this is my take, but he, he's saying the angels are not sexual beings. They can't be married. They're not, they're spiritual beings. They can't, they, you're, you're, you're manifesting, you're projecting your humanness, your anthropomorphism on spiritual beings. It just doesn't work out that way. And the reason is, is because we're, we're already engaged in heaven and the person we're going to be with forever is Jesus. And so here's my third question. The first, again, is who's the boss? The second is, what do I own? The third question is, to whom do I really belong? From an eternal perspective, who do I really belong to? Because I can belong to anything for a moment, but when all the dust is settled and I become part of that dust, I'm going to belong to someone. All right, last question. Number four, Matthew 22, 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer. And in our countries in the Western world, I hear the word lawyer, and we normally go, oh. They asked him a question. Saying, teacher, notice the teacher in all three of these. Which is the great commandment in the law? Mark tells us who was ascribed to. And ascribed, by the way, is a person that, if you will, is a translator of text that then decides how to write commentary on it. We might call them theologians today. But Luke gives us a really in-depth look at this guy, and he's a, he's a lot more than this. In verse 25 of Luke's text, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, testing him and saying, Teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus is like, well, let's talk about the commandments for a second. He's like, well, I think I've done them. Well, then what's the great one? What's really? So what's the point in all of this? And it's my fourth question. Well, what does he really want? The commandment is what God expects from him. So what does he really want? And by the way, if you would have, if you would have just picked one of the ten, someone would try to pit you against the others and go, "Oh, well, why isn't this one?" Well, wait a minute. And, and this is the way some lawyers can work. Some people think like a lawyer. You know, the person when you tell them they look nice today, and they the first response is, "Did I not look nice yesterday?" You know, and you're like, "Let's not talk about yesterday. Today you look nice. Let's go with that." And you realize already, have you ever that way? Every conversation you have, it seems like no matter what you say, it turns into a weird argument with someone, and you were trying to be nice to them. You had nice things to say, and you're like, how did it go here? 
So if you were to say, well, what's the great commandment? You say, well, don't steal. They'd be like, well, so why is it not don't commit adultery? What does your neighbor look like? If you were to say, well, don't commit adultery, they would be like, so why are you, who's, who did you murder that you're hiding? Do you see how that works? Any of you watch any of this? I didn't, by the way, but I've just gotten quips from my wife. She's good for this. She gives me spark notes on, on these things. The Gwyneth Paltrow trial. She was skiing. Somewhere in it, there was a collision between her and an elderly gentleman who apparently seems to be in early stages of dementia, if I'm, is that correct? I'm just correct me wrong. Anyways, and so he sues her for, she tries to sue her for, I don't know, it was a half a million dollars or oh, whatever it was. He, for, for a lot of money, that's safe. And all of that, basically, the, her lawyers were like, I think she pulled them out of like Maybury, you know, kind of someplace where like, you know, people, his lawyers, his lawyers, yeah, right? I mean, somewhere where it's like everyone kind of just talks a little bit like this and just go and figure it out. And, and uh, they, the questions that they actually brought in a guy that there was their expert on, on his side to try to condemn Gwyneth Paltrow and they're like, to cause some damages that this particular gentleman has or whatever. And the guy, his own testimony, this expert said, in order to cause the damage this man's speaking of, she would have had to have been going 60 miles an hour, which is the speed of an Olympic skier. So now guess what? I didn't know this, but apparently Gwyneth Paltrow must be an Olympic skier. The point of it was, is that everything they were saying was backfiring because it was just so silly how that works. And so anything she would say, they were trying to do that. If she were to say, well, then the greatest commandment is don't cover your neighbor's stuff. She's like, yeah, but who'd you kill? You know, and that was the idea. Well, what idol do you have in your house? But Jesus just encapsulated it by actually saying the overarching theme is this. This is what I really want. And I want you to hear this because this is the way we conclude this. This is God speaking to us. God, if you were going to tell me to do one thing, what would you tell me to do? God says, love me. He's like, just love me for real. Love me with all your heart. Don't give me half-hearted love. Give me real love. So here are my questions. Who is the boss? On this day, on this Tuesday, while the lamb is being inspected, here are my questions. Who's the boss for real of your life? And uh, can I just say, Submission isn't submission to you disagree. If all God does is bless you and give you stuff and so forth, it's easy to follow a God like that. But the moment he tells you to do something you don't want to do, do you do it? Because that's really where his boss is. Second question, well, what do I own? And according to our text, I own me. That's what I own. Have I given him me? Have I offered my body as a living sacrifice? Have I offered my body as an instrument of righteousness, a tool in the hand of my maker? The third is, to whom do I belong eternally? Am I still trying to be it? By the way, nobody dies single in regards to an eternal perspective. You either die alone away from Christ, belonging to the enemy, as a tool of torture, or you die betrothed to the King of Kings. And what does he really want? Like anyone who's betrothed, you would hope this is what they really want. They want your love. So as we go to prayer today, on this Tuesday, when Jesus had passed all this, and then, by the way, Jesus does throw a zinger at them about David. Like David said, he speaks of his own son, right? The son of David has to be the Messiah. And when he says, the Lord says to my Lord, so he calls his own son, Lord. Any of you guys ever do that? <laughs> How does that work? And, of course, they didn't have an answer for any of the questions Jesus asks. But, of course, that's the way it is. And, and here's how we conclude this. I go back to rounding the corner over here at Ferdinand Street. But infinitely greater is a God who reached out his hand to us. When our own sin and guilt and shame and plowed us to the ground and we were too lame to walk. When our own desires and confusions and our pursuit of an identity that was the opposite of God was so goofy that we had blinded ourselves with this. And he reached out his hand and he said, will you please, I'm coming to die for you. I'm not asking you to rise. I'm coming down to pick you up. And all of our sin, guilt, and shame hung on his shoulders on the cross, just like the Bible promised, died, 
buried, resurrected, just like the Bible promised. And that resurrected Jesus says, let me pull you to a resurrected life. Will we spar such nonsense questions with him? Because the core of it is simply this, who's the boss of our lives? What do we owe him? To whom do we belong? And what does he really want anyway? And the answer is simple. The real boss is Jesus. You're going to stand before him and you'll know it. It's better to know it now. Everyone's going to confess him, Lord. It's a good, good idea to do it now. And I owe him everything. And I belong to him. God says, I've called you by my name. I have redeemed you. You are. So God, what do you really want? Real love. Honest, honest love. That's what I want. I'm not want real love. Tonight, let's reconcile that. If you've accepted the gift of Jesus, praise God. Then my prayer is that we wouldn't still look at all of this and assume that it's okay just because it's okay, but we would do some honest soul searching ourselves. What excuses have we given to not make these things an area of our life? But if you haven't, let's pray to receive him. Will you pray with me, please? In our text, God, I recognize these are four things, Father, that we would fight you over. And it's to our detriment and to your great grief. Just like two days ago, you would descend from the Mount of Olives, weeping over the people who will refuse you, even though they gave you words. And I don't want to be the boss of my life. No, that's not true. I do want to be the boss of my life, but I know that's a bad idea. But I recognize if you're going to be the boss of my life, then I owe you me. So tonight, God, jar me out of anything, Lord, that fights that. And take over, God, please. Be the boss of my life. Or as we would use the word, be the Lord of my life. I give you me. I know you died on the cross for me, for my sin, my guilt, my shame. We're buried and rose again on the third day, just like the Bible promised. And that was the price you paid to have me. And how cruel would it be for you to pay such a price and me not even to give you the product you rightly deserve? Tonight, I want to openly declare I belong to you. But for me to say I belong to you, well, for me to say to call you boss, then I owe you me. For me to tell you that I belong to you, then I recognize I owe you my love. And that's what you really want. So God, have my love now, I pray. I'm yours. In Jesus' name.